in the mid-90s, this graveyard was, like a lot of others in isolated areas, was very obscured, hardly visible because of the amount of debris, you might say. Now, as we look around, a lot of it has been rediscovered and unearthed and made to come back to life in, in, in so far as possible. You know? Before it had been cleaned, it really was inaccessible, apart from a small patch here where you can see that's been mowed. The rest of it was completely overgrown. Hello and welcome to Stories from a Living Graveyard, a podcast series created by myself, Finn DeWire, and Damien Shields, the host of the Forgotten Irish Podcast. The late summer is always a great time for people interested in the past in Ireland. Heritage Week in the middle of August sees thousands of events, many of them free, showcase the incredible history, archaeology and heritage the country has to offer. This year, things are slightly more subdued as we grapple with COVID-19, but whether you live in Cork or California, this podcast series, Preben, A Living Graveyard, is going to bring you well off the beaten track into the foothills of the Wicklow Mountains to one of the most incredible graveyards you'll find in Ireland. Neglected in the early 20th century, Preben Cemetery fell into a state of disrepair until 2010 when the Preben Graveyard Committee began what was years of work to restore this remarkable place. Through their work, they uncovered a history that stretches back thousands of years from Neolithic rock art through to incredible stories of rebels in the 1790s. This podcast was produced in association with the Preben Graveyard Committee and the Heritage Office of Wicklow County Council. We would like to gratefully thank the Heritage Council and Wicklow County Council for funding this series and the ongoing work to reveal the hidden heritage of Preben Graveyard. Sound was by Jason Looney. Finally, a bit of information on ourselves. My name is Finn DeWire and I'm a historian, former archaeologist and the creator of the Irish History Podcast. Damien is a historian and archaeologist. We actually first met working on a dig over 15 years ago. Damien has a long career in archaeology and heritage from the National Museum to years of field excavations. He has a particular interest in battlefield archaeology. He also makes a podcast called The Forgotten Irish, which focuses on Irish-American experiences, with a particular focus on the US Civil War. And now to Preben. Set in the southern foothills of the Wicklow Mountains, our trip in the height of summer in mid-July promised perfect weather. What we got was a classic Irish summer's day, as Damien bluntly put it. Traditional Irish summer weather, Finn. It's a great day. <laughs> Rain coming in sideways as we look in July at one of these nice medieval graveyards. Now, this weather left me worried about the fact that I didn't have proper boots, but ever the optimist, Damien pointed out some positives. Uh, and actually, this type of weather can be pretty good for looking around graveyards. And particularly if you're interested in reading the inscriptions and things, because a bit of damp weather can really bring out some of the more difficult to read um, names and dates on these headstones. Um, personally, it's something that I'm hugely interested in doing. I never go anywhere without looking at, for local graveyards to see some of the personal stories that you can kind of find from looking at people and just wondering about people's lives in the area that you're, you're in at any given time. Now, to give you a better sense of where Preben is in Ireland, Damien describes the wider landscape. We're in South Wicklow, near the Wexford border. Come up a very nice little gravel laneway into a small secluded little graveyard, but kind of a classic old Irish graveyard, higgledy-piggledy headstones. One of the things that's really striking um, is its setting in the landscape, even with the rain clouds and the mist coming in off the hills. And we're surrounded by some of the, the high ground that you would expect to find in this part of the country. As we walked around the graveyard, we were mesmerised by the incredible stories surrounding us. I mean, look at these ones here now. Really small, simple stone markers about a foot tall. They're not even um, worked in any significant way. But we're looking straight back into the 18th century. So there's one just over here with a cross the initials TB and 1784 written on it. So immediately we're jumping back 250 years. Immediately thinking what level of society that person is, they weren't well enough to do that they could get a full headstone, but somebody wanted to mark their name, however simply. Um, really unusual stuff. So. All the way through right to the modern headstones, people who've been buried here in recent years. So it just shows you and we know the site goes back to early medieval and even prehistoric times. 
Um, so, like, just generations of stories of these personal stories that are inscribed on each of these headstones. Intrigued by these glimpses into the past lives of people in this community, a local resident, Yvonne Whitty, arrived up at the site. This podcast series was Yvonne's brainchild. An archaeologist by profession, Yvonne has spent the last decade devoting countless hours to uncovering the stories of the people buried in this graveyard. She explained more about what the graveyard looked like before the community began working on it. About 10 years ago or more, the site was completely overgrown and inaccessible. There was laurels co- covering the centre and I just there was less than one person buried here per, per year from the 1970s, so it f- had fallen into complete... I suppose, disuse. So um, a local group got together t- with the aim of cleaning up the graveyard. And then I'm from, I would have played here as a child. We're just from down the road and we, I would have grown up here. So the group, we got together and we, um, we, they came in, they cut back the vegetation. I came on board then, knowing the h- historical importance of the site. And they st- the group got together and cleaned back the laurels. While we will examine these in much more detail, we asked Yvonne to explain some of the stories the community have unearthed. What we found was that we had a treasure trove of 17th century headstones. We have three pieces of Neolithic rock art here. We have the ruins of a stone church up in the northwest corner. And as you walk around the graveyard, you'll be able to see fragments even from architectural fragments from the church. And then we also have bullon stones, which were grinding stones. I'm not sure what people use them for. They might have been used for grinding herbs or for metal work. And they're often found at early medieval church sites. And we also found two little stone crosses. So what we really have is an open air art gallery and a museum. So in the graveyard, there's definitely, there's every story, I suppose, has its own tragic element to it. But there's definitely a couple of graves that really do stand out. So the first one will be the Mulhall family, where there was a family of six killed in a snowstorm in the 1800s, the late 1800s. And actually during the cleanup of the grave, we think that we have found a plot where they may be buried because they were an unmarked grave. But um, when we cleaned up, there's six headstones all tightly packed together in the one cut. Is it the grave? We don't know, but it's, it's potentially maybe their final resting place. Next, Yvonne talked about something that holds a special pride of place in this community, the stories of the local people killed in the 1798 rebellion, who will have an episode of their own later in the series. But here, Yvonne gives us a sense of what's to come. Then another grave, I suppose, that deserves um, special mention would be the Lacey brothers. After the Battle of Vinegar Hill, they were making their way back home and they took refuge under a bridge in Ballant Glen because the yeomanry would have been patrolling the area. And the story is, is that they met a neighbour um, and he told of their location and all six people were taken out from under the bridge and shot, executed on the spot. Indeed, the work at the graveyard brought to light a man totally forgotten from this chapter in the community's history. And originally there was six young men killed under a bridge in Ballon Glen. And we always knew, it was always well known that the Lacey brothers were buried here. So there's a grave that commemorates them in the graveyard. But we also found then, during the cleanup, we found a James Byrne. And he, um, and he was killed the 21st of June, 1798. So his grave had never been known about before. And he was almost written out of the history books. And now we, it's fantastic that we uncovered his grave as a result of the cleanup. There's still a mystery as to where the other three are buried, but we're hoping that, like, they have to be buried in graveyards in the locality. And if these guys were commemorated, there's a good chance that their grave is somewhere, maybe Whitefield, maybe Tinnahee, you know, around the area. Uncovering these stories has been a mammoth task. Today, the graveyard is a tranquil and well-tended place. Gravel paths make the site accessible. However, this is only after years of hard work by several members of the community from all walks of life. Jack Lynch, who was centrally involved in the project, moved to Preben 20 years ago after a career in the post office in Dublin. Damien interviewed Jack about his involvement, motivated by a personal quest to find a grave dear to his family. My name is Jack Lynch and I was born and raised in Dublin and uh, worked in Dublin all my life. And 20 years ago, my wife and I, and she's originally from this part of the world, we retired back down here and we're now 20 years living down the road here, only five minutes walk from the graveyard. And uh, her family, uh, her mother and father, grandmother, grandfather, brother and cousins are all buried in the graveyard. Oh, wow, OK. So, like, but there was the... Her, her grandmother was actually died in 1905. And uh, 
Her father always said that she was buried somewhere over there. There was a huge big laurel tree in the middle of the graveyard. And obviously she didn't have a headstone. So when in 10 years ago, when the, a local group decided to, to come together to clean up the graveyard, I was delighted to, to become part of it, hoping all the time to find the grandmother's grave, my wife's grandmother's grave. Jack went on to explain how the project started. So it was just a small group uh, and we got together and Joe Kelly and Pat Kennedy and myself and Eddie Whitty just cut out all the weeds and the overgrowth and all the rest of us and it made a great clearance in the graveyard. And, and when it was cleared, we just discovered a treasure of 17th century, 18th century, 1740, 1750 and 1760 headstones here in the middle of the graveyard that no one had seen I'd say for more than 50 years and maybe not for 100 years. After this had been completed, the community commissioned a geophysical survey to get a better sense of the archaeology of the site. Yvonne explains what this is. So geophysical survey is kind of like an X-ray of the ground and what it does is it picks up magnetic responses and then from that, then, um, uh, like, it's like an X-ray of the ground. Archaeological features can be, um, are detected and we can see what lies beneath the ground without actually having to do any excavation or testing. So it gives a good sense of what's there without the need to excavate. Now, this survey wasn't just a stab in the dark. Yvonne and the committee suspected that there was much more than what was visible to the eye in Preben. So we knew that there was potentially quite a lot of archaeology in the fields surrounding the graveyard and um, a clue to the name gives it away, it's called the church field. So after the graveyard had been cleaned up by the locals, so we did a geophysical survey to identify the extent of the archaeology and how far it went out beyond the confines of the graveyard. The results of the geophysical survey were intriguing. Outside in the fields all around, there's enclosures and linear features and evidence of burnt pits as well. Maybe corn drying kilns or that. Sometimes you'd find those outside of early medieval church sites where more dangerous activities, like if a spark hit, so they, they're out in the fields surrounding the graveyard. And we don't know, maybe this ties in with the Neolithic rock art that we've identified on the site, potentially. But we know that this originally this site would have been um, a lot bigger than it is today. And um, yeah, and the, our, the geophysics results confirms this. While this gave an overall understanding of the site, crucial to revealing the specific stories of the graveyard, was a project carried out by Jack Lynch, who recorded the names visible on the gravestones in the cemetery, as he explained to Damien. So right behind the Lacey grave, there's a 1747 Roger, Roger McManus grave, and it, it's only a slate headstone, and the reading is as clear as day since 1747. And I just fell in love with it and said, I'm going to start recording the headstones. Uh, and you just started off from there? I started from there. And I, I was coming up every day and every morning and every evening to try and get the light on them because, in fairness, they're all, except for the modern headstones, they're all facing east. The modern headstones, they don't care. Yeah. They're facing west yeah. and north. But all the old headstones are facing east. And uh, I got myself a little notebook and I... I, I I made several visits to an awful lot of the graves and uh, and some of them, I really fell in love with some of them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, when we were finished, and we only finished last week because I had to, I had to compare my notes with, uh, with Cantwell's notes. Cantwell did the graves in about 1950. Okay. And he did several graveyards, but he was only doing them up to 1800. And when I compared my notes with Cantwell's, uh, we disagreed on a few. So I had to come back and recheck. So it was about half and half who was right and who was wrong. Right. You right. know. But, uh, and can I just add, did you, did you find your, your wife's grandmother's grave? No. The end? No. Okay. I, like, right. Clearly, she didn't have a headstone. Right. She may have had a stone. Right. Over a grave, but she didn't. Now, in recent years, we named her on this one here. Okay. Just, to, just to give her a mention. Catherine Devereux and Sherlock. It's a lovely tribute to her, though, yeah. anyway, that looking for her grave oh, was, was brilliant. led to yeah. all of this. It was brilliant, yeah. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The results of this are an impressive catalogue of generations of people who lived in this community. But uh, we ended up uh, reading the headstones of, of 150, uh, 150 headstones, and we have 327 names. Now, seven of them don't have a Christian name. Right. They just have a surname. So of the 320 names we have... Uh, over 200 are men 
and only 118 are women. The 100, 202 men and 118 women. Okay, so they were more likely to get their names. So the women obviously buried the men first. Yeah. And nobody bothered to put their name on the headstone yeah, yeah, when they yeah. were going into it. You know, the, yeah. the ladies were more uh, worried more about getting the name on the headstone than anybody worried about getting their names on the headstone, or so it appears. Yeah. Among these was an incredible grave, which gives an insight into what must have been a remarkable life. There's a Burr Thistle grave over there. We can't get the, the Christian name. We have the surname Burr Thistle. And the only other thing we can read on it is aged 108 years. Wow. Now, Cantwell, in his reading of the grave in, 17, in 1950, thought that it was either 1701 or 1704. Now, we, we can't hang our hat on that. It's definitely 1700, but we, we but if it is 1704, the man was born in the 1590s. The man was alive when Elizabeth I, I, was on the throne. Correct. <laughs> man or woman. This graveyard has continued to reveal its secrets, sometimes just in the course of maintenance work, as Yvonne now talks about one of the rarest finds. So this, um, this piece of rock art that we're looking at here was actually discovered by Joe Kelly when he was strimming the graveyard. And he just, it's quite incredible that he found it because he, like, you know, he was strimming, working away. He looked, he looked at the stone and he knew that there was something different. So then Chris Corlett happened to be down in the graveyard that day and he came over and we looked at it and lo and behold, a beautiful pockmarked um, piece of rock art. And it, again, this has been reused as a headstone in Preben Graveyard. And this is about the, so you're looking at between 4,000 to 2,400 BC. Yeah, and somebody has reused this probably in, they, they've reused it probably in the 1700s on. We don't know exactly what date um, but the earliest, I suppose, the earliest stones that is 1738, so we can assume, and there's one beside it there, 1739. So we assume that somebody erected this headstone in and around 1700s, mid 1700s. While we were immediately drawn to some of the more ornate headstones, Yvonne was also keen to point out that there are traces everywhere of people less well off who couldn't afford to have their names inscribed in stone. In terms of the headstones here, in a way you've got, I suppose, like a real example of you've got the people who could afford headstones, who could afford stone cutters of the time, and they have quite elaborately carved headstones. Then you've got people maybe who, who they wanted to remember the dead. They have a simple X marked on the stone. And then they've got other people, who the people who are poor in the times of the famine, and they just have simple grave marks where there's just a slate stone inserted into the ground. And we have 322 names recorded but there's at least three times that amount in little grave markers that are left here, you know, in the unmarked graves. So, and you can see the amount of humps and bumps the whole way through the, to the graveyard. Like this, this site has been, people have been buried here for a long, long time. And you can, as you can see by the topography, all the little mounds and humps and hollows. In the coming episodes, we will hear some of the stories of people buried in Preben. In part two, which is out tomorrow, we will return to the earliest of these stories, from the Middle Ages and before. Until then, Sloan.